we're gonna go ahead and open up with review. All right, so go ahead, pull out your, your note card from last week. We, we opened up with, with Samuel. We got started into a lot of Samuel, First Samuel. Okay, so that's our book. Who's our author in First Samuel? Samuel, nice job. And he got some help from some of his companions. Who were his two companions? Gad and Nathan, right, thank you. All right, how many chapters? 31. Um, what's the theme? Nice job. Mike Sparks paid attention. Thank you. The establishment of the kingdom. What's our anchor verse? 1222. First Samuel 1222. For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake because it hath pleased the Lord to make you his people. And hopefully you know your outline. Okay, so... Um, here's the deal, guys. These are going to come in handy to you very, very, very soon. So in the next hour or so, and then the coming days, these note cards and the handouts and whatnot are going to be very important. All right. So hint, at the end of the class, I'm going to be handing out a midterm test. All right. So we've been uh, over our uh, first 10 books, and I have, to, I have to have a grade for the midterm for you guys. So if you are taking it for credit, um, it's, not, it's not hard, I promise you, okay? Uh, I really am a nice guy. I could have made it a lot harder, but I am nice, and so it's, it's easy. If you pay attention whatsoever, I'm gonna make a special one for Lacey because she's shaking her head at me right now, right? Uh, if you pay attention at all, you should be able to do well on this. So it will, I will let you actually take it home, okay? Uh, honor system, no cheating, um, no, no using your Bible, honor system on a Bible test, okay? Um, so you can take it home and then bring it back to me Sunday, okay? Sound good to everyone? No, you can't use your note cards. You can study right before and then take the test using your note cards, but you can't look at them while you take the test, okay? I know I didn't. But you remember at the beginning, at the syllabus, I, I left that little like fine print that said I basically get to do whatever I want. I like it. That's where it's coming into play now. It will be easy, I promise. I promise it will be easy. Okay? All right. So, that being said, let's go ahead and get started tonight in, in some of uh, the rest of First Samuel. Okay, so you remember last week uh, we left off. There is a, a lot, a lot, a lot in First Samuel and in Second Samuel. Unfortunately, I wanted to go over a large portion of the stories and the narrative. It's very exciting, very beneficial to us. I'm not going to be able to do that, all right? I have a lot left to cover. Our last official week is December 17th that week, so my last official class will be December, around December 20th. I have a lot more to cover. So what I'm going to do this evening is pick up where we left off from last week, okay, so right around chapter 13 is where I'm going to pick up, and I'm going to do so from a very specific lens, all right, because we uh, have some main characters in the book of 1 Samuel. Saul and David, obviously, are two of our main, main characters, and so we are going to see the rest of the book of 1 Samuel through their eyes, all right, specifically for a reason, there's, there's a reason coming for this, but specifically through the eyes of Saul, all right, and so at the end of the book, we're going to do a brief character study on the man, and I think it will be very beneficial to you, okay? So, chapter 13, all right? God lets us know that the events that take place in this chapter happened two years after Saul began his reign, all right? So two years into his reign, chapter 13 takes place, and we already begin to get a glimpse of things that we'll be able to look back on as what the Bible calls the beginning of sorrows in the reign of Saul, First, he tries to vaunt his own leadership by taking credit for the victory of his own son, Jonathan. Jonathan leads this, this army uh, to this great battle. Saul tries to take credit for that, uh, for the victory that, that, that Jonathan achieved in, in Geba. Uh, next, secondly, the Philistines begin to rally themselves again together uh, to come against Israel. And Saul delays in attacking them. He, he, he holds back and the armies are found cowering in caves. So the people of God crossing the Jordan River, taking down these great and mighty armies in, in, um, in Canaan not too long ago, right? Uh, now are found cowering in caves in, in the hills at the enemy at the hand of the Philistines. When Samuel did not return, as Saul expected, he took it upon himself to carry out the role of priest in sacrificing the burnt offering. 
And just as he was offering the sacrifice, our man Samuel returns. And he immediately asks, what in the world are you doing, Saul? And like a little child, Saul explains to Samuel that he didn't want to have to offer the sacrifice. But since Samuel wasn't around to do it, he forced himself. He was forced to violate his own will and his own conscience and take care of the priestly duties himself. Saul explains, excuse me, Samuel explains to Saul that though he had been fully positioned to lead Israel the remainder of his life, that now, because of his failure to obey the Lord, his reign in the kingdom would not continue. Chapter 13 and verse 14 tells us, and we're going to look at this here in, in just a minute, but the verse tells us that God is looking for a what? A man after his own heart. That certainly was not Saul. As we move into chapter 14, rather than Saul seeking to humble himself and become that man after God's own heart, he is lifted up with pride. And, and watching him try to hang on to his position and power becomes very, very, not funny, but it's, it's, it's pitiful, really. It, it, it's, it's sad. He begins to, to make foolish decisions in chapter 14 that result in him almost taking the life of his own son. He almost kills Jonathan. And he would have had the people not rescued him. Saul becomes foolish, fleshly, and full of himself as he begins to, to bring the nation of Israel down with him. Chapter 15, God gives Saul a very clear command to totally annihilate the Malachites. And by all outward appearances, it looks like he's actually going to do something that God tells him to do. He gathers, gathers the troop, he, he prepares them confidently, and courageously leads them into battle. And yet, despite the victory, Saul actually finds a way to turn the victory into defeat. After the hard part was accomplished, so the battle's done, the hard part's over with, Saul allows his flesh to control his thinking, and as a result, he reinterprets God's command to annihilate everything that had to do with the enemy, and he willfully chose to do something that better suited and satisfied his own carnal fleshly desires. He keeps some of the spoils of the battle. And, and now listen, listen to what he does. He rationalizes it, that he, did, that, that he kept these things to make a sacrifice to Jehovah, right? Give a spiritual answer. We've all had that thought before, right? There is a line in our Christmas play that is too carnal of a reason in and of itself. Quick, give a spiritual answer. The demon whispers to the Wildwood church member. It's, uh, it's interesting. You have to come check that out to play. Spoiler alert. There you go. But spiritual answer given for this total wickedness from Saul. Chapter 15 and verse 35 tells us, Samuel came no more to see Saul until the day of his death. May we learn from this tragic event in Saul's life to do what we know to do. The command was clear. There was no mistaking the command to totally wipe out, get rid of the Amalekites. Just do what you're supposed to do. I've said that multiple times in our lessons here throughout the Old Testament so far. Just do it. You, you know what you're supposed to do. The Bible is clear. It's not that hard to understand. It's not that hard to read and see Hey, flee fornication, okay? Just do it. Don't compromise. Don't give spiritual answers. Don't rationalize it without justifying it. Just don't do it. Just do what the Lord says. May we follow this simple counsel that Mary gave to the servants at the wedding in Cana of Galilee in John chapter 2, verse 5, when she says, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. Do it. As a result of the removal of God's Holy Spirit upon Saul's life, the oppression of an evil spirit quickly comes and takes the, takes the place in Saul's life. Ironically enough, now get this, the only cure for the oppression of this evil spirit was the beautiful playing of the harp by a young man by the name of David, who unbeknownst to Saul, to Saul at this time, was God's choice to replace him as Israel's king. Now, he would quickly find out who David really was, and he would quickly try to put an end to this young man's life. But for now, it was the only comfort that he could find from this evil spirit. Note that in the Old Testament, kings would be anointed for service with the indwelling 
of the Holy Spirit. But unlike the born-again New Testament believers, they were not sealed with the Holy Spirit, as Ephesians 1 and verse 13 tells us, meaning that they could lose the Spirit's anointing. And this is why, after King David's infamous sinful act with Bathsheba, we find in his confession in Psalm chapter 51, he pleads and asks the Lord, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Okay, so as the emphasis in scripture forever shifts from Saul to David, it is thrilling to note that what was at the very shift of this entire passage of scripture was what? Was the heart of the man. While Saul was a choice based on outward appearances, David was a choice that was made based on the fact that he was a man after God's own heart. Chapter 16 and verse 7 says, But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance, nor on the height of his stature, because I have refused him, Saul. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For the man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. And it is of vital, vital importance to recognize just how serious our God is about the state of our inner man. God takes your heart and what your inner spirit is like very seriously. Now, notice The word heart is found 765 times in the Bible. And seldom does it refer to our physical blood pumping muscle. All right, so that was the end of our narrative from last week. As we move into the the remainder of the 31 chapters here in in 1 Samuel, uh, we are going to do so through the obsessed lens and picture of Saul. Saul becomes absolutely possessed by this evil spirit to take the life of David. Chapter 18, we're going to look at these, these different chapters through this. Chapter 18, the resulting jealousy in Saul's, in Saul's heart caused him to fear David, that he would try to overthrow his kingship. And in, in 18 verse 9, there is a very telling sign of what was to come, right? And it says this, and David I and Saul, excuse me, and Saul eyed David, from that day forward. He was always looking, always fearful, always watching. Saul recognized that the Lord's hand had not only been removed from his life, but that it had now been placed on that of David, making him even more, more jealous and thus more fearful. All right, so skip ahead to chapter 22, all right? So chapter 22, David is again fleeing Saul and he's, he's figuring out what's going on and he actually, David hides his parents. All right, so he has to hide his parents in the, in the plains of Moab, um, which is interesting if you think about who was David's grandmother, right? Ruth, she was a Moabitess, pretty, kind of a little smart there from David. She takes, he takes her, he takes his parents to the, to the land of Moab, and, and he's headed off uh, to a different journey, and, and Saul figures this out. And, and when Saul figures out what he's doing, he's filled with rage against his own men, and he, he throws himself this little pity party. He accuses them of conspiring against them. He berates them for not informing him of the covenant that Jonathan had made with David sometime earlier. No doubt, seeking to suck up to the enraged king, one of Saul's keys leader. Now, I don't know if you guys have ever read anything about Doeg, but this dude was a rat, all right? I, I mean, I, there's just something about the name Do, Doeg. I mean, it's, like, it's a weird name. And, and then when you find out what he actually does... You don't like him even more, okay? So Doeg goes and he tells Saul that when David had inquired of the Lord in in the land of Nob, when he went to Ahimelech, the priest, Ahimelech had ministered to David. And now get this, get to the, see the depth that Saul has stooped to when he commands his soldiers to annihilate Ahimelech and anyone that was found wearing a priestly garment. The men of God. The men that God had set apart to serve him, to make the sacrifices, to be the intermediary for God's people, were now under attack by the leader of Israel. The men of Saul refused to do it. They will not do it. But his boy Doeg goes out and he kills by himself 65 priests. Saul commands him to do so, and he does it. Chapter 23 and verse 5 shows us that when Saul heard the news 
that David and his men were shut up in the gated and barred city of Keilah, Saul is so spiritually disoriented that he actually views this as a God-given opportunity to put an end to David's life. Saul is called back to Israel, okay, so he gets a message to come back to Israel because the Philistines are attacking the city. He goes back, but again, as soon as he is done defending the city, he is off chasing after David, and he takes with him now 3,000 soldiers that were constantly surrounding him, okay? And now get this, Saul just happens, okay, to enter into the very cave where David and his men were hiding in the pitch darkness in the sides of the cave, right? So Saul and his 3,000 men that are always at his side, are always around him, are traveling, looking for David, and they go into this cave, and he goes in, he enters the cave, Saul enters the cave alone to cover his feet, all right, so that's the Old Testament term for he had to go to the restroom, all right, he's going to take a nap, all right, and, and, and what an opportunity for David to finally be able to rid himself of the enemy. I want to take a second and just quickly talk about David. We're focusing on Saul for sure, but let's take a second and, and look at the man of God here. With all that David had faced in dealing with Saul's rage, remember, javelins hurled at his head. For, for decades, he is running about the countryside from Saul. In our humanness, it would be hard to fault David had he taken advantage of this unbelievable twist of fate as his enemy lay alone, unprotected, literally within arm's length. David might well have interpreted this opportunity as God communicated to him the very thing that David's own good men were whispering in his ear. You have to remember that the text tells us that these men that were with him were encouraging David. Hey, this is your chance. This is your opportunity. Take it. Seize the day. This is of the Lord. This was the way that the Lord intended to deliver David from Saul's irrational and unreasonable pursuit. And oh, David was certainly tempted. You, I mean, Put yourself in David's shoes for just one millisecond and, and, and imagine being an arm's length away from this man that had constantly chastised you. But David refused to listen to anything other than the clear message that there would be another time when God himself and God's own timing would provide David's deliverance from Saul and his rise to the throne through only events that God himself could orchestrate. Had God, David, moved at this time? I mean, obviously God is in control, God is sovereign, but who knows what would have happened. And David even worried that he had failed the spirit of the test by embarrassing the king when he cuts off a small piece of his clothing to let him know that he could have killed him. He had simply chosen not to do so. Once again, David's sensitive heart pleases God. And once again, May David's sensitivity to the Lord's perfect will for his life cause us, cause you, cause me to examine how we are responding and listening to the word of God and his will for your life. God was able to use the realization that David had the perfect opportunity to take Saul's life, but refused to appease Saul, at least for the time being. By God's grace, he caused a deep sleep to fall upon Saul and his band of 3,000 soldiers again. And, and this time, David takes Saul's spear and water bottle while he was sleeping rather than taking his life. And David is able to, again, prove to him that he did not aspire to kill him. Chapter 28. Chapter 28 in 1 Samuel is maybe one of the saddest chapters in the entire Bible. When we first met Saul, in chapter 9 of 1 Samuel, he stood higher than any of the people. And God had set before him a future that was incredibly bright and incredibly promising. But by chapter 28, however, he has stooped lower than any of the people that he led. He is literally on his face in front of a demonically empowered witch asking her to help him know his future because God was no longer with him. Saul asked her to call up Samuel from the dead, and surprisingly enough, Samuel actually does appear to Saul. It was even surprising to the witch, and by the sound of her voice, it freaked her out, all right? So you have to read that, chapter uh, 28, verse 12. It freaks this witch of Endor out. 
um, that, that Samuel even appears. And at the end of Saul's life, he falls on his own sword. He ends his own life before the enemy is able to taunt and torture him. Going through his earlier life, his time as king and his final years and, and, what was, and what that brought about for him, I want us to finish this amazing book by, by doing a, a quick character overview and study of the life of Saul. All right? Saul was Israel's first king, and he was one of the most striking and tragic figures throughout all of, not just history, all, all, the entire scope of history. We must be sensitive to his story. And if we are, we will surely, surely be challenged as to the vital issues and values that this life brings us. All right, so first of all, let us look at his potential. Let us look at his potential. Very few on earth. The only person that I can, can even think of that had the potential that Saul had was Samson in the book of Judges. Very few had fairer promise or greater possibilities than Saul had in his early life as a young man. Okay, so first of all, look at his physical potential. Look at his physical potential. He is described, now, now get this description of, of the man here. A choice young man and goodly. There was not among the children of Israel a goodlier person than he. From his shoulders and upward, he was higher than any of the people. All right, so he had health, he had height, he had handsomeness. All right, I am, at least I got my health, right? I definitely don't have the height, and I definitely don't have the handsomeness, right? So chances are good. If, if Saul would have walked in here, all right, the, the ladies of Wildwood would have at least probably noticed, and the men probably would have too, all right? He struck everybody when he walked into the room. You, you noticed Saul when he came in here. And, and, and this was actually important to him, all right? So if you remember that the very first time that we, that we get the sense that Saul is a little perturbed at what is going on, what, what comes about? The ladies are singing a song, all right? The babes are out there singing, and they say what? Saul has slain his thousands, and David is ten thousands. And this was, like, this was a big deal. His physical stature was a big deal to Saul. And if you think about it, physical stature puts a man a lot of times in a good position, right? It, it, it conveys leadership. And while we know this is not of utmost importance, we would be lying if we did not say that the physical nature of the man is something that this world looks to as a status of authority. This was for sure an advantage for Saul, as it gave him the immediate advantage over every other man of, of being prepossessing in his authority. Now, to all my other average gentlemen out there, think, think okay, so think with me. How was, let's, let's, let's talk about David for a second, because I can't, I can't relate to Saul and the physical stature, the physical capabilities that he had. I'm sorry, I just can't. I'm average in a lot of ways, all right? I'm average in my height, my size, my looks, okay, whatever. For the average guy out there, there's a lot of just average men, okay? Think about David, the man that was chosen, right? He didn't have the looks. He had the freckles. He was ruddy, red hair. He didn't have the size. He puts on the armor of Saul, and what happens? It falls off of him. He doesn't have the physical stature that Saul had. This, this is not how God works, okay? Luckily for us, this is not what God is looking for. Get over your physical limitations, guys. Get over how you look. Get, get over all of that because God is, is more caring. He cares more about what is on your heart. What is inside matters to God. All right? So we see his physical potential. Next, we see his disposition potential. All right? So Saul had some, some characteristics about him, not just physically, but mentally. And his character qualities were, were quite striking. First, he was discreet, all right? He was discreet. He is disrespected supremely by, by what are described as the sons of Belial in chapter 10 and verse 27. They say, how in the world can this man lead us, disrespected as the king of Israel? And he, it tells us he holds his peace. As a young man, he knew how to hold his peace. He was discreet. He was modest. He asks, who am I to lead these people? And then in chapter 10, verse 22, we find him hiding among the stuff when he's introduced as, as a king. Now, it's a little weird, but at least the man wasn't prideful, right? 
He could have been prideful. He stood above everybody. He could have been, get out of my way. I'm taking this totalitarian authority and I'm running with it, man. But we find him actually hiding in the weeds and someone's got to go find him when they're introducing him. He was, at least he was modest. He was generous. He had a generous spirit, chapter 11 and verse 13. He was considerate. He respected his father and he, we find him what? When we first see him, he's out doing a duty, a task that his father could not do. He's out searching for the, for the donkeys for his dad. He was courageous. There's, there's no doubting Saul's courage. He, he, he led his people into battle multiple times. And he had a capacity for strong love. Chapter 16 and verse 21. He had a strong capacity for love. And this actually might have been part of his downfall in the end. But, but he had these, this disp- disposition about him that allowed him to be successful. That allowed him to be a man that people looked to. And, and his character was... was was above par. And then he had also, we, we see his potential in the special equipping that God gave him. God gave him some special spiritual equipping. The verse, chapter 10, verses 6 and 9 tell him that God actually gave him another heart, okay? So, so God comes up, obviously that's not a physical heart, right? He gives him a, another heart almost spiritually inside of him. Chapter 10, verses 6 and 9 tell us that the spirit of God actually comes upon Saul, All right, so this is the anointing of the king. He is given a band of men, all right? This legion of men that God touched. We see that in chapter 10, verse 26. He is given one of the wisest counselors, the wisest men. Samuel is his counselor. And God signals his reign by giving him mighty military victory in the first chapter that we see him going into battle in chapter 11 and verse 12. Okay, so this... This was the young Saul, full of promise. He was extraordinarily blessed in natural endowments and specially equipped by supernatural guidance and deliverance. His future seemed supremely bright. But the next thing that we see is his decline. Despite his strong start, Saul drops extremely fast. The first thing we see is his irreverent presumption, chapter 13. And we've talked about some of these events, but quickly, let's see. Let's, let's put them in a nice, neat package and nutshell for everyone to see what, what Saul really was dealing with on the inside. First of all, his irreverent presum- presumption. Saul, in an impatient, hasty move, presumes to take on the duties of the only available to the priest. And he foolishly offers up a version of sacrifice to the Lord while they wait for Samuel a Gilgal. Okay, so he obviously violates the simple obedience to the voice and revelation of the word of the Lord. And Samuel's rebuke goes like this. Saul, thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of Jehovah. All right? So Samuel rebukes him. It's almost as we see the the next few chapters. This is his slap on the wrist. This is his warning. Dude, shape up or ship out, man. Right? You've done foolishly here. Next, we see in chapter 14... His rash willfulness. We see the rash, foolish death sentence offered up by Saul on all those who ate the food that day of battle. His hunger-stricken warriors violate the command. They had no idea that he had given this command, and they violate that, including his own son, who had to be saved again by the people. And then lastly, we see his disobedience and deceit. Chapter 15 offers us Even more grave failures of Saul. He spares the best of the Amalekites as opposed to wiping them out completely as he was instructed, clearly instructed. He even pretends again that the spoils are going to be used for for the sacrifice. And from this point on, his decline is at an exponential rate. The spirit of the Lord again is replaced by an evil spirit. He tries to kill David three times while hunting him down daily like a dog. Twice, David spares his life. And in chapter 26, now get this. Chapter 26, verse 21, Saul gives us his very own description of himself that rings true even today as we study his tragedy. He tells us this about himself. I have played the fool. He gives this false confession, this false asking of forgiveness to David and God. And he says... I have played the fool. Next, we see his final failure. 
This giant wreck of a man who once enjoyed direct counsel from God himself is found in chapters 28 and 31, groveling with the witch in the underworld. And we see Saul's final plunge of witchcraft. And the next day, we see his suicide. Saul is no more. My, how the mighty have fallen. Clothed and promised as a young man, but later decline and final ruin lead to Saul, truly having played the fool. We would, ourselves, we would do ourselves a gigantic favor if we took tonight some time to ask ourselves, what was it that led this once great man to such depths? What lay behind this fearful self-frustration? Now, now get this. This is important. Every one of us must, must understand what happened to Saul. It was his self-will. His besetting sins were disobedience and presumption. But the root cause, what really ultimately inside caused these outward displays of sin was his impulsive, wicked, flesh-ruled, and unsubdued pride and self-will. We see clearly his trail of ruinous demise, self-sensitiveness, self-assertiveness, self-centeredness, and finally, in the end, self-destructiveness. Let's take some, some time and learn some life lessons. From the grave, Saul screams to us and tells us these lessons, and we would do well to heed and pay close attention to them. Okay, so number one, true fulfillment is obedience to God's will for your life. True fulfillment is not found in making six figures. True fulfillment is not found in your girlfriend or boyfriend. True fulfillment is not found in your wife or your husband. True fulfillment is found in following the will of God for your life. And if you don't like that, I'm sorry. But you're going to end up just like Saul. He was meant to rule in conjunction with the leading and guiding of God's word and God's moving in his life. And we, like Saul, are called to execute a plan and will that is higher than our own. Matthew 28 clearly describes that for us. We are God's. We are not our own. And he has made us the rulers over our own personalities and gifts and abilities. But that rule is meant to be done alongside his guidance and his leading through his holy word in our lives. The next thing we see is do not let self get the upper hand. The Philistines, David, Jonathan, 65 priests that were killed, Samuel, nor God himself were Saul's worst enemies, though he certainly thought they were. His own worst enemy was himself. How many times have I taken a character just from these first 10 books of the Bible? And how many times have I said that? Their own worst enemy was themselves. It wasn't the wicked, nasty nations that came against them. It was the wickedness and nastiness inside their own heart. If you can't figure that out, you're going to end up like Saul. Every man who is controlled by himself to the point that he is blinded to the working of God in his life most certainly joins Saul on the stage of life as you both play the fool. And lastly, wonderful opportunity nor special spiritual equipping Make a man. Every man is given the ability to choose whether or not he will take what God has given him in this life and use that with God's word to shape his life and the decisions that he makes. It's your choice. Now the list of lessons goes on and on and on and on from the life of Saul. And if you don't listen, if you don't heed these warnings, you will end up standing next to the man on the stage playing the fool. Now, I'm sorry that wasn't a very encouraging end to the book of 1 Samuel. However, we, we must take these, these warnings because, again, Saul from the grave is screaming to us, pay attention, listen, and take heed. All right, so this takes us to the book of 2 Samuel, all right? This book of 2 Samuel, and we actually are going to do our absolute best to get through the entire book, okay? So, 
Hold on, here we go, right? So the book, the author, Samuel, again, uh, you'll remember that these were originally one book. They are broken into, t- into two books to designate the different rulerships and kingdoms. All right, so 1 Samuel, again, focuses on the judges, the end of the judges, the life of Samuel, and then it focuses on Saul and his reign and then the choosing of David, okay? The theme, now this is important, our theme is the throne of David, The theme is the throne of David. There are 24 chapters. And our anchor verse is 2 Samuel 3, verse 10. To translate the kingdom from the house of Saul and to set up the throne of David over over Israel and over Judah. Excuse me, from Dan even to Beersheba. All right. Pretty self-explanatory anchor key verse there uh, in regards to our theme. Uh, Let's do an outline. All right. So our outline goes like this. David's partial reign. The partial reign of David, chapters 1 through 4. His national reign in chapters 5 through 10. His carnal reign in chapters 11 through 18. It's pretty sad that his, man, the man after God's own heart, his carnal reign takes up the majority of the chapters. Man. All right, and then his final reign. His final reign in chapters 19 through 24. All right, so tonight as we close and as we go through the book of 2 Samuel, we focus our attention on this one major character. It highlights the life of David as king, all right? And so what you'll notice is that 1 Chronicles also highlights David, but he, it does so as the first ruler of an eternal empire. And, and the last eight chapters are devoted to David's preparation of the temple in 1 Chronicles, and we will touch on that. The, the doctrinal theme of the book, all right, so the doctrinal theme is the Davidic covenant, all right, the Davidic covenant, we will touch briefly on that. And one of the most significant events in the book is the establishment of the throne of David. This is so significant because of that doctrinal theme of the Davidic covenant, which sets the stage for the millennial reign of the Messiah on the throne of David as the King of Kings and as the Lord of Lords. First mention of the throne of David is found in our key verse in chapter 3, verse 10. And David clearly emerges as a very clear type of Christ all throughout the book of 2 Samuel. Okay, so you have your big handout again. All right, you got your big one for 2 Samuel, hopefully. There is a a lot of awesome charts in that. Um, But the first one that you see is David as a type of Christ. Okay, Um, you'll want to check that out. But as with all types of Christ in the Old Testament, they all break down. And this is very evident in the second part of Samuel, it's, it's sad. It really is sad as you read through the narrative. David, man, such a great man. And then chapter 11 has to come along, right? And David is seen as a type of the flesh and the devastating fruit produced when one's life, one lives a life self-centered and fleshly. David experiences victory and gain like never before, but he also experiences loss and defeat like never before. In the end, however, because of God's power and faithfulness, The house of David will be established forever. All right? So that leads us into the outline. Leads us into the outline. The first thing, the first four chapters, we see the partial reign of David. And under each of these, we have some some subtitles and some themes. And the first thing we need to see is the king's heart. David's heart is on full display all throughout multiple different episodes in 2 Samuel. One of the things that we just saw in in 1 Samuel chapter 13 and verse 14 was this, but now thy kingdom shall not continue. Okay, so he's again talking to Saul. The Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart, and the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. All right, so this person, as we know, that the Lord is referencing is David, and the man that God had chosen had to be after his own heart. The king of his people was to be led and directed by none other than God himself through the heart of a man that was dedicated to following him. And as we just saw, that most certainly was not Saul. He was chosen by the people. As we look at the heart of this man of God, we must keep in mind the fact that David wanted no part of being Saul's enemy. He truly didn't want to be part of it. He loved Saul's family. He was friends with Jonathan, Michael, Saul's daughter was his wife, one of his many wives. But because of the carnal mindset of Saul, 
he made David's life beyond miserable for more than a decade. All right, so keep that in mind as we get into the first chapter of 2 Samuel because we see David's heart in response to the report from the Amalekite. All right, so let's, let's get one thing straight first here. Okay, so at the end of uh, 1 Samuel, we have the story of Saul falling on his sword, killing himself before the enemy gets to him, right? Then in chapter 1 of 2 Samuel, we have this Amalekite coming, and he gives a totally different account. Is there a contradiction? No. Okay, so let's use our brain for, man, I hate this thing. Let's use our brain for a second, all right? So you're an Amalekite who just got done with battle in, in, in Israel, and you're coming to this new king. The old king has just been killed, right? You're coming to this new king. And what do, you, what do you want to do? You want to impress this new king, right? And so what? Man, I got rid of the old guy. This guy's going to take over. I'm going to embellish the story a little bit. So in chapter 1, we see the Amalekite come to David and he says, Listen, man, I took care of Saul for you. Dude, you're welcome. You owe me one. What can you do for me? Okay? I, I took care of him. He, I stumbled upon him and he said, Hey, you know, take care of the rest of me. I, this isn't going to cut it. I didn't do a good enough job. To, and, and so the Amalekite lies. The Amalekite embarrass, or excuse me, embellishes the story. It is not a contradiction. Again, he's fibbing. He's lying to David. All right? And how does David respond? How does David, how would, ask yourself this, how would you respond to the man dying that has chased you for decades now, caused you to live in caves, wander the wilderness like a dog. How would, how would you respond? David responds a little bit differently, okay? He genuinely mourned Saul's death. He genuinely mourned him. And then he kills the Amalekite who claimed to destroy the Lord's anointed. Again, we see an Old Testament principle set up for how God thinks and treats his anointed. And then he lamented and eulogized Saul and Jonathan's death. Not just Jonathan, who was his best friend, but Saul, his father, who again chased after him for years. Okay, let's see. David did not celebrate Saul's demise. He could have reacted any way possible, right? You you know, you had this coming, man. You reap what you sow. That's the natural human reaction, but we see the exact opposite from the man of God. He did not reward the Amalekite. He did the exact opposite of that. And then he did not see this as a win for him personally. Okay, so Israel is lost, right? They've just been defeated in battle. They're without a leader. He's lost his best friend. And if he would have been looking at this selfishly, he would have seen this as a win. But he didn't. He saw this through the lens of of having God's own heart. He saw this through the lens of his people. And he took it as an absolute loss and for... For weeks he mourns, okay? So our classes here um, are in hopes of training up the next leaders at Wildwood. That's what we're in the business of doing at these classes. We want to get you prepared to be in positions of leadership at Wildwood. And so as we look at the heart of David, the soon-to-be leader of Israel, I want to point out some ministry principles that we're going to see exemplified to us through David's life, all right? So as we go, I'm going to be pointing these out. You have them on your sheet. They are important, all right? So, key ministry leadership principle number one. You cannot make ministry leadership about you. Saul made his role, his leadership, about himself. And what happened? Well, we just saw, right? The moment that you start thinking about personal gain or personal benefit on any level whatsoever... In ministry, you are thinking and moving in the wrong direction. If you are doing this for personal gain, you're in the wrong business, man. You're in for a world of trouble if you're out for yourself. You cannot make God's work about you. All right, this takes us to 2 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 1 where it says, And it came to pass after this that David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up into any of the cities of Judah? And the Lord said unto him, Go up. And David said, whither shall I go up? And he said unto Hebron. All right, so our next thing that we see is, although David had been anointed by Samuel and King Saul was dead, David did not act presumptuously. He inquires of the Lord. 
And, and what we're going to see is that David's inquiring of the Lord. Okay, so what does that mean? His prayer life, right? David's prayer life plays an important major role in the blessings that David has on his life all throughout the book of 2 Samuel. David's heart never presumed upon God. What was one of Saul's downfalls? He was presumptive. He acted before he was led of God. He thought he knew better than God. The heart, of, the heart of David, the heart that's described as a man after God's own heart, never presumed on God. He inquired of the Lord. Key ministry principle. Presumptuous leaders produce disastrous results. Presumptuous leaders produce disastrous re results. As leaders, we must be taking our prayer life seriously. We must never presume upon the Lord. We must never assume that we have reached the level that we know better than God's word. Because the moment that we start to do that, we're going to produce disastrous results. The next thing we see was that David was anointed king over the house of Judah, but not the nation of Israel as a whole. The first four chapters are his partial reign. He rules over just Judah. He is from the tribe of Judah. He reigns in Hebron for seven years, seven and a half years. Key ministry principle. When God moves, Satan counters. We have to be mindful of this. David is probably thinking in chapter 1 and chapter 2 as he mourns that he is about ready to take over the throne in Israel, the entirety of Israel. But what happens? Satan counters and raises up Abner and Ishbosheth, right? And they initiate a coup, so to speak, and they take the entire 11 tw tribes, and David gets stuck with just Judah for seven years. For seven years. Wherever you see a movement of God, be on the lookout. Because Satan is more than likely getting ready to what? Counterfeit or counteract what God is doing. We also see the sovereignty of God, okay? Chapter 3, verse 1. Now there was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David, but David waxed stronger and stronger, and the house of Saul waxed weaker and weaker. The sovereignty of God refers to God's role in the affairs of men and is seen in the weakening of Saul's house and the strengthening of David's. All right, so despite the hand of blessing on David's life, the crack in his moral armor continues to widen as he multiplies wives. All right, so we know that David was a polygamist. And this was never God's plan for man. Whether or not you are described as the man after God's own heart, it's pretty clear in the law that David was not to have multiple wives. He tolerated it in the Old Testament, but it was never the plan that he desired for man, as he continually warns them of the cursings that will come to the man that multiplies wives unto himself. And this crack in the windshield of David starts just a little bit, right? I have a crack in my windshield that's about this big. I'm just waiting for the day that it goes from this big to this big to this big to the spider web, right? We see the little crack here. Key ministry principle. Ministry leaders are ripe for moral failure during and directly after seasons of great blessing. This is seen time and time and time and time and time again all throughout church history, all throughout our lives. We can point to multiple men of God who received great blessing, had great congregations, were doing great things for God, and then what happens? Women come along, money comes along, and they fail morally. The sovereignty of God is on further display as God used sin and sinful men to translate the kingdom of Israel to David. All right, so let's read chapter 3, verses 6 through 10. And Saul had a concubine whose name was Rizpah, the daughter of Ea, and Ishbosheth said to Abner, Wherefore hast thou gone in unto my father's concubine? Then was Abner very wroth for the words of Ishbosheth. And said, Am I a dog's head, which against Judah do shew kindness this day unto the house of Saul thy father, to his brethren, and to his friends, and have not delivered thee into the hand of David, that thou chargest me today with a fault concerning this woman? So do God to Abner, and more also, except 
as the Lord has sworn to David, even so I do to him, to translate the kingdom from the house of Saul and to set up the throne of David over Israel and over Judah from Dan, even to Beersheba. God uses sinful men and his sovereignty and sinful acts, sinful wickedness to bring about his plan. Key ministry principle. In ministry, you do not have to make anything happen. All we must do is believe, have faith, trust in him, allow him to work, and get out of his way. Take God at his word. For, okay, so for once, stop trying to do something in and of yourself. And, and just try it for once and see what happens. Try to get out of the way and try to let God work in your life. And, and see what happens. Just, just do everyone a favor and give it a shot. Why not? Nothing else is working, so why not try this, okay? Get out of God's way, have some faith, and let him work. As a matter of fact, you can't do anything without God and his hand on your life. Isaiah 14, verse 27 tells us this, For the Lord of hosts hath purposed, and who shall disannul it? And his hand is stretched out, and who shall turn it back? Next, we see David's national reign. So he finally gets the house of, of Saul is, is taken care of. He finally gets his national reign over all of the tribes. And we see the king is embraced. David was anointed, embraced as the king of Israel and did not do anything to make it happen. God did it. This is now the third anointing of David. We see the first in 1 Samuel 16, verse 13. He's anointed of Samuel. 2 Samuel 2, verse 4, the men of Judah come. And now 5 and verse 3, all of the elders come to Hebron and anoint him as king. And notice that in each of David's anointing, he does nothing to push or advance his own timing or his own agenda. He simply waits patiently for the Lord to move. David was a mighty man of patience. I mean, talk about the patience of Job all the time. But listen, my man David's got some patience. I, I don't know if I could have waited that long to be king over all of Israel. 2 Samuel chapter 5 and verse 7 records the first mention of Zion in the city of David. All right, I'm going to quickly go through some of these real quick. Mount Zion was one of the hills of Jerusalem. It can refer to the city of Jerusalem. It can refer to the nation of Israel and the temple area. I think all of the verses are listed there. David would move the ark of the covenant here. The te Solomon's temple would be built here. The temple would be rebuilt here. It is where Christ will rule and reign during the millennium. And ultimately, the earthly Jerusalem points to the millennial Jerusalem and the heavenly Jerusalem, which are to come. The Lord loveth the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. All right, so the Lord is moving. In verse 10 of chapter 5, tells us that David grew great and the Lord was with him. However, we go down just a couple more verses and we see the following. And David perceived that the Lord had established him over the king, as king over Israel. And that he had exalted his kingdom for his people and for Israel's sake. Now get this next verse. And David took him more concubines and wives out of Jerusalem after he was come from Hebron. And there were yet sons and daughters born to, to David. And again, the crack in the windshield, the crack in the armor continues to spider out for David. Second Samuel chapter 6, David attempts to move the ark and his intentions were good, but his approach was not. And it initially ends in disaster. Okay, so ministry principle. Good intentions never justify the disregard for God's word. Okay, so we see in Psalm 119, right? David loved the law. David loved Leviticus and Numbers. I know it's hard for us sometimes to love those books, it seems like, but David loved it. It says that many times. But he, he forgets to love Numbers chapter 4, verses 5 through 12. Aside from his polygamy, this was the first true failure of David in his reign at this point. And, and this was an easy one for David. This was something that, that he should have known and remembered and referred back to. Because he was in the caves, being chased of Saul, right? And he's reading the law. And this had to have come to his memory in numbers. Because you see, he could love it. David could love the law all he wanted to. But if he could not practically apply that which was found, it was of no good to him. All those nights in the caves while being chased by Saul, 
We're ready to be put to use, okay? So here you go. Here's your opportunity, David. But he fails to be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. Okay, so what, what have we studied? What have you studied in your Bible reading this week? Hey, I am so glad that you have studied your Bible. That's, I mean, we're, that's what we're pushing. I mean, we're trying to get us in the Word of God, reading the Word of God, loving it, desiring it, wanting to be in it each and every day. But if you don't apply it, it does you no good. You can love it, desire it all you want, but if you continue to fail day after day after day and go against what God says, it's, I mean, you might as well not even read it. That's what David does. And it leads to his, his first sin besides his polygamy. Good intentions never justify the disregard for God's word. All right, next we see the eternal promise from God. Okay, so God makes seven promises to David through the Davidic covenant. This is our Davidic covenant here. Uh, permanent homeland for the nation of Israel, the lineage through which the Messiah would come, the descendant that God would establish a kingdom through, a descendant who would build God house, God's house, a kingdom that God would establish forever, a descendant that God would have a personal relationship, and a covenant that God would never break, okay? So in your large handout, there is a, a gigantic um, study on the Davidic covenant. Um, the implication of this covenant were literal. This is important for you to understand. There was a literal land, a literal lineage, a literal son, a literal throne, and a literal kingdom. Okay? Go home this week and, and, and study this out. Make sure you do it correctly because this is important for us to understand and our doctrine and so on and so forth, all right? We see the carnal reign. I am quickly ending, I promise. We see the carnal reign in chapters 11 through 18. David's sin with Bathsheba is hard to fathom considering all the things that God had done for him up to this point. He had become king over all of Israel. He had taken Jerusalem and established it as his capital. He had moved the ark to Jerusalem. God had promised him and given him eternal promise Chapters 8 and 10 give us incredible victories. And now here's the thing. What we see is that in David's sin with Bathsheba, he actually breaks every single one of the Ten Commandments. Every single one of them in his entirety of the sin. Uh, if you want that, I have that listed out here, plain and simple. Um, I will give you that. I don't have time to go over it this evening, but it is interesting. We see the discipline of God. From, first, from 2 Samuel 11 to 1 Kings 2, everything in David's life is touched and affected and colored by that event in 2 Samuel chapter 11. His entire life at the end is affected by his sin with Bathsheba. Ministry leadership principle, the price of sin is always greater than the pleasure of sin. Always, without fail, your sins will find you out. David's price tag, I mean, I don't have time to go through all this, but there's a huge price tag that David pays. Um, his sin with Bathsheba, the child born, dies. Uh, Amnon is raped. Uh, Absalom's murder. Uh, he, Absalom leads a rebellion. He's murdered by Joab. Sheba leads another rebellion against David. Another ministry principle. There are some sins that leave a permanent mark on your life, okay? There are sins that will affect you for your entire life. That, that happens. That happens to, it happened to David, the man after God's own heart. And then his final reign. We see a king's return. He is restored to the throne. He, he finally overcomes Absalom. All right, we see the mercy of God. David's sin with Bathsheba was, was not his worst sin. 2 Samuel 12, verse 13. 2 Samuel 24, verse 10. And then we see, again, David chooses to do the census, and God allows him to choose the consequences of doing so. David messes up big time, man. He messes up big time, and he gets to choose his consequence. He chooses a pestilence. 2 Samuel 24, 15 tells us that from Dan, and Beersheba, to, from Dan to Beersheba, 70,000 men are killed because of David's sin. Ministry principle to end it to this evening. Sin might take place on an individual level, but the results are always collective. Those of us that are in leadership, that want to be in leadership, of the flock of God... Your individual sin is collective. 70,000 men pay the price because David could not listen to God's command. Don't let these happen to us. As we seek to be leaders 
of the flock of God. We have to answer for it. We have to answer for the things that we've done. Be sure your sin will find you out. Do not fall into the trap that David did. All right, that wraps up 2 Samuel chapter 11. All right, like I said, I do have a test for you. Do not freak out over the test. All right, it's very simple, very easy. Take it home, do your study, bring it back on Sunday. If you, if you are taking my class for credit, you have to take it. If you're not taking it for credit, but you want to see how much you know, take it. I don't care. I'll grade it, and I'll get you guys a grade by next Wednesday. All right? I'll have these graded by next Wednesday for you, as long as you bring them back. If you don't bring them back, well, it's not my fault. Okay? Let's pray, and we will be dismissed, and I will hand these out for you at the back. Um, Demetrius, will you come in and take an offering? And then also, too, one more thing. We quickly have to set up. Uh, tables. Uh, we've done a lot of, of the work already, but there's a few more tables that we have to get set up for the widow's breakfast. So if you uh, are a man and can help, or, or a lady if you want to help, um, you're more than welcome to stick around and get some chairs and tables out, and um, we'd appreciate that. All right, let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to study, stu- excuse me, study your word this evening. I ask, Lord, that you would help us to remember the lessons that Saul gives us. Remember the lessons that your Lord, your man, after your own heart, teaches us so many things. He teaches us a lot of things to do. And so in the column that says to do, Lord, may we write those things down. May we pay attention to David's life and may we do those things each and every day. May we love your word. And then, Lord, may we put it into practice. May we be doers of your word, not hearers only. And may we, we take this other column and, and at the end of David's life from chapter 11 and 2 Samuel through 1 Kings 2. And may we see the downfall of David. May we see the wickedness that he falls in and the sin and the consequences of that sin, Lord. May we apply it to our lives. Give us a good evening. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.